That is the prayer of our heart, that the Lord would make us a sanctuary. We are the, His dwelling place, His temple, His sanctuary, the place that He is making holy. And thank you, choir and Kim, for leading us in worship. His name is great. And when David is facing Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17, he declares to Goliath, you come at me with swords, but I come to you in the name of the God of Israel. And that is the greatest name ever mentioned, Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Today we find ourselves in 1 Samuel chapter 23. 1 Samuel chapter 23, and hopefully you received a um, kind of a handout. Um, it does have the sermon outline on it, but it also has a few definitions and just a, a few things to help you. Kelly and the boys, I walked into their bedroom this morning and Kelly was doing devotions on her bed because she wasn't able to get out of the bed. And Jack and her, and her were having a detailed discussion on what a threshing floor was. And so I th she said, you know, you need to define some of these terms for everyone because not everyone knows what a threshing floor is. And then they got to ephod and so they just had this list of words they wanted to find so i thought we'd give that to you hopefully that helps you um and then there's also a map there because uh, david is in the wilderness he's making several journeys and you kind of can trace his steps as he leaves eventually Ramah in chapters 20 and 21 he's going to go on down to uh, nob to visit ahimelech and that's where the priests are slaughtered in chapter 22 david is fleeing on down to taking his family down into the southern part of judah ended up actually in moab and then coming back when he's rebuked by the prophet Gad, and he ends up um, there in Adullam, the cave in Adullam. So um, he is now in the wilderness, and he is thinking about uh, this city called Keila. It really depends on how you divide the syllables in Hebrew. I'm going to pronounce it Keila, and uh, you can pronounce it different ways. I shared with the group on Wednesday night, when we come to Hebrew, especially in the Old Testament, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, then uh, there are several ways that translations spell transliterations which is just when they just carry over the they try to make the sounds in hebrews it's spelled differently so you have people's names and place names that are spelled differently in different translations so i may read um, a place name and it may sound different from your translation that's okay because we we have to remember we're reading a translation and secondly i'm not that great at phonics so sometimes I just miss it. And usually Kelly's there to call me out and say, um, I don't know where you learned to read, but that is not how you pronounce that. So uh, you just kind of have to go with it sometimes. And so things are pronounced a little bit differently, and sometimes I mess up. But we're going to pronounce it Keela and divide the syllable between the E and the I. So um, let's make our way in chapter 23. I'm going to read the entire chapter. Then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to work our way through it. So if you found your place, hear the word of the Lord, 1 Samuel chapter 23. It was reported to David, look, or behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and raiding the threshing floors. So David inquired of the Lord, should I launch an attack against these Philistines? The Lord answered David, launch an attack against the Philistines and rescue Keilah. But David's men said to him, Look, we're afraid here in Judah. How much more if I go to Keilah against the Philistine forces? Once again, David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered him, Go at once to Keilah, for I will hand over the Philistines to you. Then David and his men went to Keilah and fought against the Philistines. They drove their, flies, their livestock away and inflicted heavy losses on them. Some translations say they brought a great slaughter on them or a great defeat. So David rescued the inhabitants of Keilah. Abathar, the son of Ahimelech, went to David at Keilah and he brought an ephod with him. When it was reported to Saul that David had gone to Keilah, he said, God has handed him over to me, for he has trapped himself in by entering a town with barred gates. Then Saul summoned all the troops to go to war at Keilah and besieged or attacked David and his men. When David learned that Saul was plotting evil against him, he said to Abathar the priest, Bring the ephod. 
Then David said, Lord God of Israel, your servant has heard that Saul intends to come to Keilah and destroy the town because of me. Will the citizens of Keilah hand me over to him? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? Lord God of Israel, please tell your servant. The Lord answered, he will come down. Then David asked, will the citizens of Keilah hand me and my men over to Saul? They will, the Lord responded. So David and his men, numbering about 600, left Keilah at once and moved from place to place. When it was reported to Saul that David had escaped from Keilah, he called off the expedition. David then stayed in the wilderness strongholds and in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. Saul searched for him every day, but God did not hand David over to him. Verse 15, David was in the wilderness of Ziph in Horish when he saw that Saul had come out to take his life. Then Saul's son Jonathan came to David in Horish and encouraged him or strengthened him, some translations say, in his faith in God, saying, Don't be afraid, for my father Saul will never lay a hand on you, for you yourself will be king over Israel, and I will be your second in command. Or some translations say, I'll be right by your side. Even my father Saul knows it is true. Then the two of them made a covenant in the Lord's presence, and afterward David remained in Horish while Jonathan went home. Verse 19. Some Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah and said, David is hiding among us in the strongholds of Horish on the hill of Hekela, south of Jeshimon. Now, whenever the king wants to come down, let him come down. Our part, or what we will do, will be to hand him over to the king. Verse 21, May you be blessed by the Lord, replied Saul, for you have taken pity on me. Go and check again, investigate and watch carefully where he goes so that we can see where he's at, then come back and tell me because he is extremely cunning. Verse 23, Look and find out all the places where he hides. Then come back to me and bring accurate information and I'll go with you. If it turns out that he's really in the region, I'll search for him among the clans of Judah. So they went to Ziph ahead of Saul. Now David and his men were in the wilderness near Maon in Arabah, south of Jeshimon, and Saul and his men went to look for him. When David was told about it, he went down to the rock and stayed in the wilderness of Maon. Saul heard of this and pursued David there. Saul went along on one side of the mountain, and David and his men went on the other side. Even though David was hurrying to get away from Saul, Saul and his men were closing in on David and about to capture them. Then a messenger came to Saul, saying, Come quickly, because the Philistines have raided the land. So Saul broke off the pursuit of David and went to engage the Philistines. Therefore, that place was named the Rock of Separation. From there, David went up and stayed in the strongholds of Engedi. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, as we take some time to reflect on these verses, we are reminded that your son, Jesus, is the great son of David. He is the, the anointed Messiah, King of kings and Lord of lords. And so as we reflect on David's actions, we realize that he foreshadows the coming of Jesus. May we learn more about you. May we learn more about how you work. May we learn more how you strengthen our faith from day to day. Father, we confess that none of us enjoy being in the wilderness. None of us enjoy suffering and hardships and trials, but as you remind us in James 1, these trials, they increase our faith. They strengthen our faith. They mature us in our walk with you. As Peter also says, they purify our faith. So we thank you that you love us enough to purify our faith. We thank you that you love us enough to send us into the wilderness. But we are also grateful that you are there in the wilderness with us and that you speak to us while we are there. May we hear you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever found it difficult to trust the Lord? Maybe 
in the big things in life i'm sure you can think of a few times in your life maybe when it's a career change you're trying to negotiate or think about should you move across the state or should you move to this place should you leave this job or that job and you are struggling with trusting the lord that this is what he wants you and your family to do maybe it's regarding family decisions um should we make this decision in our family you know, why is it difficult for us to sometimes trust the Lord? It may be simply because we're not sure that this is the Lord's will, that making this move or making this decision is what the Lord would have us to do. We're not sure we have a clear word from the Lord, and we do not want to step out until we're sure this is the will of the Lord. And that's okay, but there's other times when we know that this is the will of the Lord. The Lord would have us to do this. In fact, there are scripture verses that actually give us principles to make this decision. We're assured that this is what the Lord would have us to do, yet we still find it difficult to trust Him because we just do not see how all the details will work out. We don't understand how this could possibly be the will of the Lord. So yeah, there's, I'm sure there's many times these big moments of our lives that we can think about. We can remind ourselves of times when maybe we didn't trust the Lord or we did trust the Lord and it worked out when we trusted Him or He opened our eyes to show us that we're getting ready to make a mistake. But there's also those small moments, those small events that happen in our lives from day to day, week to week, where we need to trust the Lord. Maybe it's when someone slanders our name or someone talks bad about us and we're wanting to retaliate. I know when I'm in my home, I'm constantly reminding our children, you do not repay evil for evil. When someone slanders you, when someone does something against you, that doesn't mean you hit them back. It doesn't mean you slander them back. It will never bring good for, by repaying evil for evil. We have to remember that as adults too. No matter what our age, whether we're 5 or 50 or 80, we must not retaliate, but sometimes it's so difficult for us to trust the Lord that he's going to bring justice. We need to stand up for ourselves, don't we? We need to bring justice. Or maybe it's during those small moments where we think we have to manipulate the situation. We want this to happen in our life. We want the details to work out like this, so we drop our name here, or we try to orchestrate all the details there instead of simply trusting the Lord. Or maybe it's when it comes to being generous. We know the Bible tells us blessed is the one who is generous. It's more blessed to give than to receive. We know the Bible commands us that we're to give to others, but we're just barely making it. How are we to be generous? And we find it difficult to let go of that which with the Lord has blessed us with in order to bless others. Or maybe when it's when it comes to repentance. We just are not ready to let go of our sin, whether it's pride or selfishness. Whatever the sin is, we're not ready to trust the Lord. We realize that it is often difficult to trust the Lord. We have many opportunities in our lives to demonstrate either our lack of faith or the existence of faith in God. There are many moments, whether they're big or small, as we come to 1 Samuel, we also see that David has had many opportunities to demonstrate his faith in God. He's done so. At times, his faith has shown really bright. At other times, his faith has fallen flat. He has demonstrated his faith on the battlefield, in the throne room, in the tabernacle, in the wilderness. But he's, he will fall, as we see later, in the bedroom. He will fall uh, also in the tabernacle when he went into Nob. And he wasn't trusting the Lord when he asked for the sword of Goliath. So David is not perfect. He makes mistakes. And that makes us realize that this narrative, it keeps us on our toes. This is not a straightforward Narrative. It's not a straightforward story. Maybe you have never read First and Second Samuel before. If you haven't, and you're just reading it as we journey along, I'm sure you're on the edge of your seat if you're the least bit interested. You're on the edge of your seat wondering what's going to happen next. Because these characters are unpredictable. The story is unpredictable. We have no idea what's going on. There's a turn and a bend uh, behind every chapter. We're not sure what's going to happen next week. And we realize that these characters, the characters we thought were good, perfect, consistent, and faithful, they will make mistakes. But it reminds us that David, just like Moses, just like Abraham, 
just like Adam, David is not the hero of the story. David will make mistakes. He has made mistakes. He's imperfect. This story is not ultimately about David. Because I doubt very seriously that you would take time out of your day, gather here on a Sunday morning with your family, take time out of your busy schedule to be here for two hours on a Sunday morning just to learn about David. If this story were just about David, it would be just another history lesson. But it's relevant for our lives because this story is not just about David, but it is about the Lord who worked in David's life. So as we reflect on 1 Samuel chapter 23, we see David not only placing his faith and trust in the Lord, but we see David placing his faith and trust in the Lord because the Lord is trustworthy. We learn about the Lord's character. We learn about how he works. We learn about what he's doing in his creation. This story is about the Lord and how he worked then and how he works now. David was able to trust the Lord because the Lord was faithful. And we can trust the Lord because the Lord is faithful. We see David trusting the Lord in the midst of danger, in the midst of a precarious situation, when he's vulnerable, when he has no place else to turn, when he's afraid, he places his faith in the Lord. And it's actually in those times in our lives when we face fears, dangers, we're vulnerable, where the Lord lets our faith shine the brightest. None of us like to be in the wilderness. David's not enjoying the wilderness here. He's wondering what's going on. All you have to do is read some of the Psalms that he wrote while he was in the wilderness, and you realize he was not enjoying his time, but he placed his faith and trust in the Lord. So as we reflect on this chapter, we are going to see vividly that the Lord uses those times of hardships. You can call them your wilderness journeys or your wilderness wanderings, but the Lord uses those times to deliver, shape, and mold us into godly followers of Jesus. He's doing something during those times. And although the New Testament was not written yet, I'm sure David could, could be recognized the verses of James that I quoted earlier in my prayer, where James says, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be fully complete, lacking nothing. So first of all, I want you to see this morning, the wilderness was David's training ground for the throne. The wilderness was David's training ground for the throne. Let's say you were going to be a king in 15 years. You knew you were going to be, you were the anointed king over Israel. You're going to be the king. You're going to ascend the throne in about 10 to 15 years, and you want to prepare for it. Or maybe your son is going to be king in 10 or 15 years. So you want to make sure your son is ready to be the king. He's going to lead this great nation. He's going to have a lot of responsibilities. He's going to need to be a great leader. How would you train him to be the king of of Israel, maybe in a palace, maybe making sure that he knows how to ride the finest horses, no, he knows how to use the latest weaponry, he's a great swordsman, maybe he needs to know the latest battle strategies, and he needs to understand how to fight, um, whether it's Philistines or whether it's any other enemy. We need to remember that David did not grow up in the palace. David grew up on the side of a mountain shepherding sheep. And although he didn't learn swordsmanship or the latest battle tactics, he did learn in the wilderness, but also in the sheepfold, the one thing that he would need the most. And he tells us that in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Remember, as he is talking to Saul, as he's about to go out and face Goliath, what does Saul say to him? Why, you're just a youth. This Philistine has been a, in battle. He's been a warrior from his youth. Why are you going out without sword? Why are you going out without armor? And what does David say? When I was back in the sheepfold, a bear would come in and take one of the sheep. I would go after him, slay the bear, and rescue the sheep. A lion would come in, take the sheep. I would go slay the lion and rescue the sheep. He says, the God who delivered me then is the God who will deliver me now. And what David was expressing was his faith in the God who delivers. David learned in the sheepfold what he's going to learn and, and, and kind of strengthen in this chapter. And that is his faith in God. 
He was the anointed king over Israel we see in chapter 16. Do you know how many chapters ago that was? Should we not be asking ourselves, why is he not on the throne? Why is Saul still not on the throne? David, what, are you still trusting in the Lord? You should be on the throne by now, but now he's in the wilderness. He's experiencing victory one minute, but for the last several chapters, he's been fleeing for his life. Saul has tried to kill him. He's living in the wilderness. He's in the cave. He's fleeing for his life. His army is simply a bunch of ragtag misfits. Those, as chapter 22 tells us, were discontent, were destitute, and they were in debt. They didn't have anything to bring to the table. This is supposed to be the king of Israel, but yet David still trusted the Lord even in the wilderness. Even in his struggling, even in his hardship. And it was in that wilderness that God was shaping and molding him and, and refining his character to make him the future king of Israel. So it was in the wilderness that the Lord was training him. And it may be in the wilderness that the Lord is training us for something. He's shaping us, he's molding us to make us ready for his use. And sure, we want to do it in the palace. We want to do it with the latest gadgets and all the technology that we have. We want to do it with the comforts of life instead of in the wilderness. But God was using the wilderness to shape David. Second point this morning. The wilderness was an opportunity for David to serve others. The wilderness was an opportunity for David to serve others. We should be thinking, well, if you're in the wilderness, you're barely getting by, you're in survival mode, you should be looking out for number one. But that's not the case with David. He is concerned about this city, Keilah, while Saul is not. Notice that Saul is the king of this city. This city is a part of Judah. They belong to Saul's people. And while Saul is not going out to defend them, he really doesn't care about them. David is concerned about them, so he prays to the Lord. Lord, should I I go protect this city? The Philistines are coming in. They're robbing their threshing floors. It's like someone coming in and robbing their grocery stores. They're taking away all of their food. They're taking a advantage of them they're oppressing them lord should i go and rescue them and the lord says yes well david's men comes to him and says you know what we're pretty vulnerable the way it is if we are to go down into the city then we're going to be really vulnerable saul can just come down and take over us the people could hand us over to him and david says you know what you're right let me go ask the lord one more time and so david goes back to the lord and the lord says the same thing yes go down and rescue them i will deliver them so david takes his misfit army down into keilah defeats the philistines with a great slaughter based on the word of the lord not according to the size of his army he makes this decision based on the word of the Lord and he's willing to step out in faith and serve others. He is concerned about the welfare of this other city and the only thing that would bring Saul out of his city of Gibeah was his hatred for David, not his love for his own people. Yet David, as he's fleeing, he's compassionate. He's loving these other people by going out of his way to serve them and putting himself in a very vulnerable position. Saul will even say when he hears about David going down to rescue these people, David's in a very vulnerable position. He's blocked himself in. He's, he's, He's in this city where he's in a wall. He can't get out. We can trap him. We can get him. This reminds us in the New Testament of the son of David, Jesus. Who was able to be put himself in a very vulnerable position. And talking about the crucifixion and, and in an appeal for us to follow like Jesus. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians 2, Let each of you not only look out for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then the Apostle Paul goes on to describe the the humiliation of Jesus as he humbled himself to the point of death. Why? For others, not for himself. Jesus would also say it another way in Matthew chapter 20 when he's talking to his disciples and one of them's wanting to sit on his left and one of them's wanting to sit on his right. He says to them, it shall not be so among you. He's talking about the Gentiles who lord their power over those who are under them. He says, it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom 
for many. Jesus was willing to give his life and for the sake of us, to redeem us for our benefit, to buy us back. And we see David here in chapter 23 finds the wilderness an opportunity to serve others. Third point this morning, the wilderness was David's opportunity to demonstrate his trust in the Lord. And I've already touched base on this, but the wilderness was David's opportunity to demonstrate his trust in the Lord. There was no giant to face um, here, but there was Saul, who is the king, seeking to destroy him. Earlier, if there was no giant for him to face, he would have never demonstrated his faith. If there was not a bear in the sheepfold, he would have not demonstrated his faith. If there was not a lion in the sheepfold, he would not have demonstrated his faith in the Lord. If David's back would not have been against the wall here in the wilderness, he would not have had an opportunity to trust the Lord. But now his faith is shining bright as he's trusting in the Lord when he's in this vulnerable position. We will note later in 1 Samuel, that when David's in the palace and everything's going great, he's not fighting anyone, he's not running for his life, things are going great for him, his faith falters. As he commits adultery with Bathsheba, he murders her husband, he lies about it. His faith is faltering when everything is going great for him, but it's in the wilderness that his faith shines brightly. And we know it's in the wilderness that he seeks the Lord. He listens to the Lord. He obeys the voice of the Lord. Not in the palace, not later when things are going great, but now in the wilderness, in the hardships, the Lord reminds him how much he needs him. He inquires in this chapter, which is unique. Kelly was actually asking me about it this morning when we were talking about this text. She says, you know, it seems as though David's just been praying to the Lord, but now he's inquiring of the Lord. And I said, yeah, exactly. That's the point of the author. He says, Four times in this chapter, he inquires of the Lord. He puts on the priest's ephod. He puts on the garment of the priest. He is now the kingly priest. He steps in. He asks the Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do? And the Lord speaks to him and tells him. David is trusting the word of the Lord when everything is going wrong. His actions are based on the confirmed word of the Lord. Notice he doesn't say, well, I'm going down to the city because I think God would have me to do it. He doesn't say, I'm going to go into the wilderness because I think God would have me to do it. But he's no, he knows that this is God's will and he acts on the word of the Lord. When God calls us to do something, we are to act on his word, which leaves us asking ourselves the question, well, how does God speak to people today? How does God speak to people today? He spoke to David, apparently. This is before the Old Testament was written. They have the Pentateuch or the first five books of the Bible at this point, but they don't have the rest of the, the Old Testament. How is God revealing himself? Well, at this point, he's revealing himself through the priest. Earlier, he, re re he revealed himself through the prophet Samuel. And all throughout the Old Testament, the Lord is revealing his word to these prophets. He's giving them this word. As we come to the New Testament, the book of Hebrews tells us, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. That's how he's speaking to David, through the prophet Samuel, through the priests, as he's in the tabernacle. The book of Hebrews says that's how God used to speak. But in these last days, he's talking about in these days, the days after Jesus has risen from the grave, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the world. So how does God speak to us today? Through his son, the Logos. And that's what John is telling us when he comes to the New Testament. God speaks to us now through his word. Now the Holy Spirit takes this word and applies it to our lives to teach us but it's through this word now can God speak audibly today yes he can God can do that if he so desires but more times than not he speaks through his word and this is more sure than anything audible for instance if you were to say to me well I heard God speak audibly me to me yesterday how do you know that how do you know God spoke to you audibly yesterday well it could have been just a it's a bad some bad something you ate you know, it could have been something that wasn't digested properly. 
It's kind of like, you know, the, the, the episode there with Scrooge when uh, Marley comes to him as the ghost and he's saying, you're just a bit of uh, undigested beef. Now, God can do that, but there's no way to check it. But we do know when God speaks to us through his word, we have it. We can turn back to it. And this is more sure. You can memorize it. You can hide it in your heart. And you may be saying, but I don't hear God speaking to me. I read his word and I do not hear him. That's because we have so much coming in our receptors. We have so much coming into our eyes. We have so much coming into our ears. We're so busy that we simply do not hear him. But that doesn't mean God is not speaking. For instance, maybe you've experienced this, parents. If your children have video games or computer games, they're, they're, it's about supper time. You've, laid the, you've set the table. You've got supper on the table. It's time for them to eat, but they're still there playing that video game. They, they're glued to the television, and you're calling them, Johnny, come eat. Johnny, come eat. And they're just playing that video game, and you're, you're just frustrated. And you say, you know what? I'm done. I, I, he can just go to bed without any food. And so you... You sit down, you eat your supper, you and your wife all by yourself, which is probably one of the most peaceful meals you've had. And, uh, but you said, well, it's time to do the bedtime routine. So you go over, you unplug the TV or whatever, the video con the console. You can tell we don't have video games in my house because I don't even know the, I mean, I'm still stuck on Nintendo. Um, so you go unplug it and send them on to bed. And they're so frustrated. They're like, what? I'm hungry. And you say, but I've called you for the last hour to come eat. I didn't hear you. You did not call me. And what do you say? I called you over and over and over, but you are so glued to the TV or to the video game that you did not hear me. And that's the way it is as God is speaking to us. Day in and day out, he's speaking to us, but we're so distracted that we don't hear him. And then we blame him that he's not speaking to us. When he's telling us over and over, and sometimes in his grace, he walks over and unplugs the video console or the TV. That's when he wakes us up. He shakes us out of our slumber through maybe a hardship, maybe a trial, maybe a sickness, maybe a family difficulty, whether it's financial difficulty, sometimes in his grace, he unplugs it to draw our attention to him. And when we get upset, how many times do we get upset? God, why did you unplug that? Why are we going through that? And he's saying, because I love you, because I know you need to eat before you go to bed. I love you, and so I'm doing that, and we're wondering, why am I going through this wilderness? Why am I experiencing this? Why am I suffering? And God's saying, because I love you. Because because I'm trying to teach you, because I'm trying to show you, because I'm purifying your faith and causing you to grow. When I was 17 years old, the Lord woke me up out of my slumber. I was hanging out with a group of guys that I grew up with that I should not have been hanging out with, but I knew that I've known them my whole life. They got mixed up in some things they should have not got mixed up in. And thankfully, the Lord allowed us to get caught and it woke me up from my slumber. I can remember from that point on for the next two weeks after I got caught with something I should not have had when I was 17 years old. Old, the Lord, it was like he was speaking audibly through to me, but he was not. It was even more clearer than if he were to spoke out of the heavens. He was speaking to me through his word. And I can remember the moment, the exact moment I first sensed the Lord calling me into the ministry, as clear as day, reading his word, sitting on the back pew of a church, and recognizing this is what the Lord would have me to do. As clear as I'm speaking to you right now. Why did I hear him so clear at that moment and not earlier? Because he woke me up. I was going through a difficult time in my life. And I said, Lord, I need you. My ears are open. I need you. None of us like the wilderness times. We don't like those difficult times. But it's in those times that the Lord strengthens our faith. And last point this morning. The wilderness was the place of deliverance for David. 
It was the place of deliverance for David. It was from his enemies. We see that in the beginning, chapter 23, verses 1 through 5. He was delivered from the Philistines as he went to battle them. He was delivered later in chapter 23 from his own people, the city of Kalilah, who, who actually he delivered. He saved them and they turned their back on him and they was going to turn him over to Saul. The Lord delivered him from them by driving him into the wilderness. The Lord delivered him from Saul. How did he deliver him from by Saul? By driving him into the wilderness. So the wilderness was his place of salvation. Think back to another time that the Lord delivered a people by driving them into the wilderness. The children of Israel, as he delivered them from Egypt, he took them into the wilderness. And the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8 tells us why. The Lord says, I led you these 40 years to teach you, to humble you, so that you would know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. The Lord did it for a reason. The Lord delivered them from the, the Ziphite, the, the land of Ziph who were going to turn David over. And how did the Lord do it? By his promise. You know, there's this strange little section in this chapter that I must be honest, looked very awkward to me as I read through it. It's the section where Jonathan renews the covenant with David. And as I think about that, I thought this is really odd that it's sandwiched in between these, these wilderness wanderings, verses 15 of chapter 23 through 18. Why is this in there? But it tells us that Jonathan, in the midst of David's wilderness wanderings, went out and look at what the scripture says. Then Jonathan, Saul's son, verse 16, came to David in Horish and encouraged him or strengthened him in his faith in God. How did he do that? By bringing him supplies? Well, maybe, but the scripture doesn't tell us that. By bringing him weapons? Maybe, but the scripture doesn't tell us that. He strengthened him in his faith in God by reminding him of the covenant that he would sit on the throne. He reminded him of the word of God. It was the word of God that strengthened his faith in the wilderness. So David could not hang on to anything but the covenant. He hung on to nothing but the promise of God. David trusted that he would be king even when everything around him seemed hopeless and dark. And this is not the last promise that David will receive from the Lord. Later, as the Lord is making a new covenant with David, it's actually the old covenant, but he's making a new covenant for David. He says, your house and your kingdom and your throne will endure forever. For from you, David, one of your sons will sit on a throne for all eternity and he will rule forever. But after David, he had a son named Solomon, who did build a temple, but he did die eventually. Then the story of the...